Hey guys, Moidog here, and today we're talking about squad leading. Being a squad leader is one of the most important roles in the game, and good squad leaders can not only turn a losing battle into a win, but they can also make losses feel like wins themselves. In this video, we're going to go over everything you need to know to be an effective squad leader, from creating and organizing your squad, to building fobs and moving effectively around the map, and then some general advice, best practices, and communication tips that should make this leadership position a lot less intimidating. But before we get into it, I do want to let you know that I stream a lot of squad on Twitch, at twitch.tv slash moidog. I play every class and vehicle in the game, and the vast majority of the time, I'm taking up the squad leader position. If you have any questions, want to see how some live squad leading games play out, or just want to watch some things go boom, come hang out. I also have supporter stream days where I squad lead for you guys. It's a lot of fun, so I hope to see you there. To kick it off, I do want to say that I've created this guide to not only help new squad leaders understand some of the mechanics a bit better, but also to help more experienced squad leaders improve their gameplay as well. In saying that, I would highly recommend that you not start squad leading until you've had some experience playing the game. The old saying, you have to know how to follow to know how to lead, is as true a statement as ever when talking about squad. Northwest, Northwest! Starting off with the basics, to create a squad you'll have to click the giant green create squad button. You'll see that there's an inner name and padlock next to this as well. If you simply press create, you'll create a squad with whatever number is next in line. The first squad created will be squad 1, then squad 2, and so forth. As new squad leaders, I'd recommend giving your squad a name, like Infantry, or New SL, Mike Required. Although some players may ignore the names, many players might steer away from an infantry squad if they want to run vehicles, or may be more inclined to help you out if you let them know that you're brand new. You'll yeah, also notice that there's a padlock next to the squad, squad name. You can create um, lock squads and invite specific players into it if you want to. Since squad doesn't have a party system, this is the easiest workaround. Have one person create a squad, lock it, invite your friends, and then unlock it once your buddies have joined. In saying that, however, I do want to say that as a brand new squad leader, I'd highly recommend keeping your squad unlocked at all times. Once you have created your squad, you'll notice that you have special squad leader kits that are only available to you. As a squad leader, you must use these kits, and many servers will actually kick you from the game if you don't have one. This might seem harsh, but squad leader kits not only give you a rifle and grenades, but they also unlock the squad leader radial menu. This kit is the only way you can build fobs and request tactical strikes, so it is incredibly important to have. To access the radial menu, press T. By clicking in the middle, you will create a point of interest marker. This map marker not only shows your squad number, but also has the grid coordinates on the map for easy callouts. On the bottom part of the radial menu, you'll have specific action markers such as observation, move, attack, build, and defend. As a squad leader, I'm always updating these markers, as it not only pops up on your screen for a few seconds, but also stays marked on your compass below. This helps your squad stay oriented to a certain area where you may be taking contact, or if you simply want to indicate a specific emplacement that you want built up. The other radial menu sections allow you to place a radio, drop a rally, put down enemy markers, or build emplacements which we will touch on later. Now that you're familiar with your kit, you need 8 other members to create your squad. Many players may have their favorite squad composition, but in my opinion what makes a good squad leader great is being able to adapt. Now, all squads should have at least one medic for quick revives and healing, but the other 7 slots are very map dependent. On vehicle heavy maps like Talil Outskirts or Yeho, anti-tank is critical, whereas infantry heavy maps like Mestia or Logar Valley, having machine guns, grenadiers, or even a marksman might be a better pick. In a perfect world, we'd have it all, but squads can't have every type of weapon. You'll notice that kits are split up into different roles, including command and support, squad, fire support, and specialists. Kits are restricted in a number of ways, with the first being the actual amount of squad members you have in squad. This means that some kits, like a medic, need at minimum two squad members to unlock, where others, like the Canadian Sniper, need even more, like five. Kits are then restricted depending on the roles themselves. One squad can only have three specialist kits, as well as three fire support kits, meaning that you can either have an auto rifleman, grenadier, lat, or marksman, but not all four. This might be a bit confusing, so here's an example. Squad 1 has the following loadout. One squad leader, two medics, one rifleman, an auto rifleman, a grenadier, marksman, an NG, and a combat engineer. This squad has a maximum of three fire support kits, but no light anti-tank. If they do run into a vehicle, either the marksman, grenadier, or auto rifleman would have to swap off of their current kit in order to unlock the light anti-tank kit. 
On top of this, some kits also have team-wide restrictions, meaning that you can only have a couple of them on a team. Arguably the most important kit that falls under these rules is Heavy Anti-Tank, which is limited to two per team. This means that if one squad has both hat kits, your squad is going to be out of luck. Because of this, it's important to adapt and keep a lookout for not only what your team needs, but what your enemy is throwing at you. Now that you have your squad, you'll want to familiarize yourself with the command map. Unlike the spawn menu, which can be opened with enter, the tactical map, or more commonly called the command map, shows a much bigger map area and can be opened with caps lock. Learn to love this map, because you'll find yourself spending a lot of time here. Although this may look pretty self-explanatory, you can click on the arrow to the left of the map to hide the squad list and enlarge the map to fit your entire screen. With the map open, you'll also be able to put down markers. Remember the observation, move, and attack markers we had on the radial menu? On the command map, we can quickly put down and remove all of these in order to help our squad and other squads see what's happening. Right-click the map where you want to put down a marker and select the appropriate one. We also have other ways to mark the map than what was available on just the radial menu, including paths to show friendly markers, plan fob creation marks and other support functions, and the complete list of enemy markers. As a squad leader, one critical part of your job is to relay information about the enemy team to other squads, and this can be done effectively by using map markers and confirming over command comms with G. When doing this, however, make sure to relay the correct information. Calling a bulldog a tank and marking it as so can result in your army and heavy anti-tank kits moving to engage and get themselves out of position, when in fact an armored personnel carrier can easily be dealt with by an infantry squad. I'd highly recommend going to the tutorial if you have any questions or are unsure about the different types of vehicles in-game. Although this is intended for beginner players, just a minute or two into the tutorial is the vehicle identification area, which not only has pictures of these vehicles, but also has the correct marker for it listed above and the official name and faction below. Additionally, while in-game, you can click this vehicle marker on the command map to confirm what vehicles are actually included on the map layer, their respawn timer, and ticket cost. When you start up a real game of squad, the first few minutes are what's called the staging phase. This is where you should use a command map we've just familiarized ourselves with and talk with the other squad leaders to come up with a plan. I won't get into the gameplay meta here since it can change drastically depending on what game mode, map, and even faction you're playing as, but typically what you want to discuss is who will be capturing points, who will be creating fobs on the front line, and who will be doing logistics. With the introduction of the commander, we also now have a designated person who should help lead this discussion. If someone is up for command, click next to their name at the top of the command map to vote for them. At the bare minimum, I'd always recommend to place move and fob creation markers where you're planning on going. This will let others plan around you, especially since fobs can only be built within 300 meters from each other. Here you should also make sure the show fob radii and fob resupply icons are ticked as well on your map. This will show the fob radius, with the blue being the buildable area and the white being where the next closest radio can be put down. While the plan is being made, organize your squad into a vehicle. As a new squad leader, you should keep it simple and stick with a Logi truck. But don't just pile in and roll out once the game starts. The Logi is my favorite vehicle in the game, and it should be yours too. At the start of the game, I would highly recommend adjusting the build and ammo to a loadout which you think will help you in the first 10 minutes of the game. A standard Logi can fit 3000 resources, and at the start of the game it's loaded up with 50% ammo and 50% build, which is 1500 of each and commonly referred to as half-half. At the bare minimum, you need to bring 600 build. This will allow you to build a hab and an ammo crate, all you really need to get going at the start of the game for defense or attack. However, if you're on a vehicle heavy map, you might want to bring 1200 build, 600 for a hab and ammo crate, and 600 for a tow emplacement. Now, since each tow is 500 ammo, this will give you three tow missiles and a few hundred ammo left over for your infantry. Or perhaps you're setting up a defensive point right out the gate, and a repair station for vehicles might be nice. Having 2,000 build will take care of a hab and ammo crate, but also allow you to use 500 to build a repair station while leaving enough build points to allow these vehicles to repair. The point I'm trying to make is that you need to start thinking and planning ahead during this staging phase. At the start of the game, I tend to tailor my logi heavy on build since everyone will have full ammo and the little ammo I do bring should be sufficient to rearm. This will allow me to build emplacements, sandbags, and plenty of ammo crates. Or I can simply grab 1200 build and divvy it up between two fobs back to back. I do also want to quickly remind everyone that helicopters work just like logis, but the carrying capacity is different. 
Blackhawks can carry 1,000 resources, while Hips can carry 1,500. As a squad leader, make sure to adjust this as well, since many players often move out in a Blackhawk, drop a radio, and then realize they can only build a hab and no ammo crate. My go-to loadouts for helicopters are the following. 600 build and 400 ammo for Blackhawks, and 600 build and 900 ammo for Hips. With a plan in place and your squad on the objective, it's now time to build a FOB. Once again, there's a lot of metagaming that can go into FOB placement, but I'll leave you with a few good rules of thumb. It is always better to have too many FOBs and too few, but do know that if you place a radio down, you should be prepared to defend it. The radio itself costs 10 tickets dug down, and since losing an objective costs 30 tickets, losing a capture point with a HAB on it can easily be a 40 to 50 point swing if you take into account player tickets lost from giving up as well. Generally, on defense, I like to have fobs both on the point and nearby. Here, we have our first fob set up on the actual objective of OP Chaxton. This fob will be used primarily to defend the cap. Directly south of it, we have another fob that will do one of two things. First, it will serve as a backup fob if OP Chaxton goes down, and secondly, it will protect our southern flank. This will help zone out the enemy, not only off of the current objective, but also to the one directly below it as well. Finally, we have a third backup fob set up in case the front two go down. Now you'll notice that I didn't set anything up in the town northeast of OP Chaxton. This is because that although this might serve as a backup fob location, if we lose OP Chaxton and the only spawn left is up north, we have no way to quickly get back down to Aring Sa. When planning fobs, try to think a couple steps ahead, and if you can force your team to spawn in more playable areas of the map, you'll be more successful. On attack, we have two areas planned out, both roughly 300 meters away from the capture point. Sometimes it's best to take the safer option for a fob, but as the game progresses, you may be able to get these in closer or even on top of enemy objectives if you read the map well and communicate with your team. To drop a radio, you must have one friendly player and a logistics vehicle within 30 meters. This does not have to be a squad member, so if you see a blueberry nearby and need to get a fob down quick, you can. Once a radio is dropped, I ask my squad to drop build first and ammo second, allowing me to place the hab and ammo crate down as soon as possible. To do this, we need to once again open our radio menu, move over to deployables, and select text structures. Choose the hab and click once again when the outline turns green to place it. Do the same for the ammo crate and indicate to your squad to get it built up quick. For other emplacements, you can click the various folders to see build requirements and place them as well. If you have trouble placing anything or finding a buildable area, try moving around and rotating these things by using your arrow keys. Once again, I don't want to get too much into the meta since this can vary wildly, but best practices for fobs are the following. Don't put a radio inside something that is too hard to get to, or can create a defensible position inside of it. Many squad leaders like to put radios deep inside of basements, high up into apartment buildings, or build a bunch of sandbags and HESCO blocks around it to block off the entrance and prevent the enemy from getting to it. What tends to happen is that enemy players will find the radio, start digging, and then the radio is destroyed before you can even get to it. Or worse, is that more than one enemy is on the radio and the person digging is being protected by a player that is now completely in cover thanks to your sandbag wall. I like to put radios in rooms and buildings with plenty of openings for grenades. If someone notices the radio is going down, we can now run back, toss some nades in, and push the position. I'm not going to pretend that this always works, but you will have much better luck in keeping a radio up by doing this. The fact of the matter is, once the enemy starts seeing your team in an area, they know that a hab is most likely nearby. And once that hab is found, the radio will most likely be permanently marked on their map. The best case scenario is to make it easier for you to take them out while they're on it. If you have to put a radio out in the open, try to hide it in a bush. With command callouts, radios are incredibly easy to take out. And once the hab is spotted from a UAV, the first thing the commander will do is search for the radio. Bushes can easily conceal radios from the UAV, and depending on the terrain, can even hide them from infantry if placed well enough. For habs, however, I like to put them in the open or in large covered areas like barns. Habs are spawn points for your team, and if you cram a hab into the top floor of a building, you create pileups and mazes just to get out, and you're essentially making it much harder for your team to defend or attack the objective. Additionally, habs inside tight places or areas with only one exit can result in players being stuck inside. 
The biggest offenders I see are insurgent Habs and Al-Basra, which are so high up in the apartments that you are stuck running for a minute just to find your way out, and hangar Habs on Talil, which are easily pushed and often only have one entrance and exit. Many squad leaders see Habs as something that should be hidden, but once you start taking contact, it's pretty easy to take a guess as to where a Hab would be. Make your Hab easy to run away from, since players should never be fighting inside of the Hab unless things have gone horribly wrong. Additionally, the previous build and ammo requirements and HAB recommendations are all specific to conventional factions. For the unconventional forces, HABs cost only 100 build, and insurgents are also able to have two HABs on one FOB. There are countless times I've been playing as insurgents only to open my map and see one HAB on the point, so remember to drop a second one, preferably on the complete opposite side of the first one in order to help with defending the point. For all factions and maps, I would also make sure to use your build for ammo crates when possible. Although it's generally required to have an ammo crate next to the hab, there is no reason that players should have to run hundreds of meters back and forth just to rearm. The fob radius is big, so put a bunch of crates throughout the fob to help your team stay rearmed. I like to place them down in buildings and alleyways where my teammates might be in future firefights, as well as a few on the outside of the radius. With your FOB created, it's important to know how to move around the map and create spawn points for your team to assault or defend in the event this radio does get destroyed. To create a rally, simply bring up the radio menu and click deploy rally button. This requires one squad member within 8 meters of you to drop and is on a 2 minute cooldown if you want to place another one. Rallies have a 60 second respawn wave, meaning that if you and your squad are all spawning on a rally, everyone will all spawn in at the same exact time. Rallies do have a minimum wait time of 20 seconds, however, so if you do die, give up instantly, and then try respawning on a rally that has 10 seconds left for the wave, you will receive a 70 second respawn timer. It's best practices to keep these rallies up and let your squad know how long is left to spawn the rally. On attacks, if a good number of my squad members are dead, I may give up and track the rally timer, telling my squad to then give up and spawn rally if there's 10 to 15 seconds left. This will ensure we keep the pressure up and are spawning in as a squad, instead of trickling in one by one. Rallies cannot be deployed if enemies are within 50 meters, and trying to drop a rally when enemies are that close will result with the 2 minute cooldown timer to reset. If enemies do get within 10 meters of your rally, it will be squashed and you will need to create a new one. Once again, insurgents are a little bit different. You can actually right click, open your menu, and create a rally off of a previously existing rally even if you're dead. Just one other faction difference that you should remember if you are playing insurgents. When attacking an objective, I like to drop my rally at least 100 meters or so out in an area that gives my squad some cover and concealment when they spawn in. Like radios, try to hide these rallies so enemy players can't see them, as it only takes one person rushing for it to destroy your spawn point. For defense, I like to use rallies in one of two ways, either as an early warning system or a backup spawn point. Placing rallies where you think the enemy may be coming from can warn you that they're in the area, and if you happen to lose your hab, a rally outside of your fob radius can allow you to respawn in and contest the point. The last area of squad leading I like to touch on is perhaps the most important part, communicating with your squad and your team effectively. There's no secret to communication, and everyone is going to find a way that they find more comfortable, but I'd recommend trying the following. First, organize your squad into fire teams. Fire teams can be divvied up between Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. Technically, you're the fire team leader for Alpha, but Bravo and Charlie can have fire team leaders that can help mark things on the map for you. Some players like Marksman or AT to have the fire team lead, while others simply like a person who can do good callouts with the fire team lead. The choice is yours, but I frequently have my fire team leaders as ones that will need accurate marks in order to be effective, such as heavy anti-tank, light anti-tank, and marksman. Remember that fire team leaders can only mark three markers on the map, so if you do see something like a hab or radio pop up from a fire team lead, I would always recommend to delete their mark and replace it with your own. So that way, this information stays on the map and doesn't disappear when they use their mark for something else. Use your markers to keep your squad busy and focused. I frequently update my observe and attack markers both in and out of combat. Use these markers to help direct players to look in specific directions or focus fire on areas where you see the enemy. While I'm pushing objectives, I frequently update attack markers to shift fire and request specific things like suppression, smoke, AT, or grenades. And if you're dead, open the command map, see what's going on, and take this downtime to reanalyze the situation or talk to your command staff. 
I would also like to say that try to keep your command comms brief, calling out to all the other squads that you're taking right. fire or uh, that you just got shot at from over there, there doesn't help anyone and creates unnecessary you noise. If you're in contact, service. mark helmets or vehicle markers as necessary and make a good, concise call out. Instead of saying, we're taking fire over here, need armored support. Say, this is squad one. We're in contact at Neva Lower with a 30 mic and infantry dismounts. Squad 4 Bradley, can you come over and help out? Updated marks on the map. By stating who you are, where you are, describing the situation, and requesting specific assets, you are more likely to get what you need. If in the situation above, you still want to talk to a squad directly, simply press the number on your numpad to use direct chat with another squad leader. Squad 1 is 1, 2 is 2, and so on. The commander is 0. For things like infantry to vehicle communication, or squad to helicopter resupply communication, I would highly recommend sticking to numpad direct comms, as these types of one-on-one -on -one conversations can really clog up command chat and make it difficult for other squad leaders to hear what's going on in their own squad. Finally, when talking to command, you or they may want to request tactical strikes like air support or artillery. To do this, open your radial menu and select the request marker on the left side. This will create an area on your command map that you then have to right click and approve for the commander to call in. If for some reason you placed it wrong, simply click the X and try again. Once you see it turn gold, the commander can then choose to approve your request and send in the strike. There's a lot that goes into being a squad leader, but the biggest thing to remember is that you're never going to pick the perfect plan. Things will happen, people will screw up, and the enemy will show up in the worst possible spot. Instead of getting frustrated and yelling at your fellow squad leaders and squad members, try to be flexible and react yeah, best you can. It will take you a while before you really feel familiar with the responsibility that comes with being a squad leader, but if you're having fun, your squad is most likely having fun too. There are plenty of games where we've lost as a team, but my squad had a great time. So don't be too hard on yourself if you don't come out on top. If you are a little nervous diving in, I'd recommend playing a map and faction you're incredibly comfortable with for your first game or two as squad leader, so that way you're a bit more familiar with how the game would typically play out. I know this was a lot to take in, but I hope it helps. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe for more squad guys, and let me know if you have any questions on squad leading in the comments below. There's plenty more I'd like to talk about about squad leading, and I will have more follow on videos with more advanced discussion for squad leaders themselves. So if you'd like to see anything specific, or perhaps I didn't touch on an area you thought I should have, let me know below as well. But that's it for me. See you out there, squad leads. So Peace.